Success Mantra is a program which features people, successful individuals from various walks of life. They are less known heroes who believe in their dreams and have conviction to live their full potential. Idols, icons, innovators who care to live every moment on their own terms. So great, uh, Harrison, to have you on the show and I'm really delighted uh, to welcome you here. It's, it's, um, uh, it's called the success mantra and you know, we focus on people who are doing something different. So not the usual page, uh, you know, newspaper, front page newsmakers or the page three newsmakers, but people who have been doing something uh, totally in a different line and supporting others staying in the background. So they are never seen. So they could be coaches like us or they could be, you know, like even uh, homemakers, uh, people who are supporting the dreams of their family. Uh, very often mm -hmm. they don't come in the forefront, right? So, but these mm -hmm. people make tremendous sacrifice and uh, support others in achieving their goals. So we want mm -hmm. to highlight such people. Uh, typically the coaches, mentors, trainers, and consultants. Yeah, mm -hmm. because uh, they don't have the billion dollar business. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't uh, make it on the Times Magazine uh, most of the time, right? But they are very, very important people in society. Hmm. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Worth, sounds worthwhile. <laughs> yeah. And you totally, you know, are doing justice to it. Uh, especially when you said that you're doing workshop on uh, this tremendous topic, uh, because it's always been, um, you know, a challenge in terms of nurturing this uh, uh, you know, persona in people, how to handle senior leadership roles and how to command the respect that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's, a, right. that's a great topic. Let's, yeah. Let's get going. Um, uh, let's, let's start with something uh, about you and it'll be great if you can tell us you, you are a coach yourself and uh, you've been doing this for a long time. However, how did you kind of stumble upon uh, coaching? Let's see. Uh, when I was in my 20s, my early 20s, okay. um, I lived in Austria, in Vienna, Austria, and I worked with a, uh, a commercial real estate tycoon who worked in Europe and really had dealings all over the world. Mm -hmm. and was hired as a marketing director, uh, but he was also in the Viennese parliament, so he was a, uh, pol a politician, okay. and he asked me to help him with his appearances, with his talks, his speeches, wow. and wow. not that I had any special training in it, it was just intuitive, you know, and plus I was uh, fluent in English already, so I'm from Germany originally. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I had native fluency in English. And so he was also giving talks to English speaking audiences. So he wanted me to help him with that. And so I worked with him for a couple of years and uh, he became pretty successful. He gave me a lot of credit uh, for his success and for his um, ability to present himself well in front of uh, important audiences. And so that's when I sort of caught the bug. Okay. And I decided okay. that that is something I would like to do. And so initially I started uh, helping uh, business leaders with their presentation skills, sort of executive communication skills right. and right. effective speaking. Mm -hmm. And so then I started my first, then I moved to the U S um, you know, mid nineties. And then I started my uh, consulting firm in 1999. Okay. And it was at the time it was called Guru Makers uh, School of Professional Speaking. So again, we focused exclusively on communication skills, on spe and effective speaking skills. And then uh, I wrote my first book with uh, my co-author, Dr. Lorena Case, mm -hmm. on uh, effective speaking called The Confident Speaker, okay. on effective speaking, and then also on managing anxiety. Wow. which is an issue wow. for a lot of people. So uh, Larina was an expert in the treatment, the study and treatment of anxiety. Okay. And I used my okay. expertise as a, uh, as a speaker and as a presenter. And so the book became a New York Times bestseller, did very well. Wow. 
Wow. And wow. then we, yeah, so then, you know, then the publisher, so our publisher was McGraw-Hill. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, mm -hmm. the publisher was interested, what's the next book? Sure. And then uh, Lorena published her, her next book. Mm -hmm. And then I had my next book two years later, and that was Executive Presence. So it was the first edition of Executive Presence. Okay. And okay. so it came out in 2009. Okay. And okay. with Executive Presence, I wanted to broaden sort of the sort of the set of ideas of what makes someone effective. So it is not just speaking and communicating well, right. but there's a whole okay. range of behaviors that makes you show up better, right? And that okay. over the years that I have researched and developed that into what is now really this topic of executive presence, sure. which um, incorporates so many behaviors, mindset, right. Um, right. you know, how you achieve results, how you manage people, lead people effectively. Awesome. And uh, so it's far beyond just confidence sure. for sure. Uh, speaking well and looking good. You know, it's, it's much deeper than that. Those are perhaps the tips Tip of the, the, the tip of the iceberg, right? Because yeah. there's a lot more that has to support this. So yeah, and that's uh, so that's how I got started. And then I changed the name of the company mm -hmm. uh, somewhere along the line. I think it was after Executive Presence came out mm -hmm. to ex uh, Guru Maker Executive Development because then we really started getting lots of inquiries from companies that want to that wanted to help their emerging leaders as well as their senior leaders yes. to yes. show up more effectively. Wow, awesome. Great journey, I must say. And that too in your 20s, uh, it's, it's just remarkable. Um, yeah. Why Guru Maker? Because, you know, like uh, you're developing leaders and others. Uh, how do you associate the word Guru uh, to mm. all these uh, professionals and leaders? Yeah, so in the American vernacular, mm -hmm. Guru is a recognized expert you know I, I think in india it means a spiritual leader right uh really? for the last part no? yeah, very close yeah very close okay <laughs> um, um that's how a lot of people at least uh, understand it but to me yeah. of course i use the american vernacular of a guru being sort of a recognized expert in a field okay and um so i thought you know, I'd like to help people become recognized experts in their field and doing so by communication skills. And so that's why I called it the, called the company Guru Maker. And it stuck and, um, you know, wasn't sure if it's going to fly, but I, it was a different name. And people had, I think, a positive reaction to it. Now, I would never know who had a negative reaction to it and who said, oh, that sounds kind of goofy we're not going to call this person you know so i i'll never know but uh you know we had we've worked with i mean hundreds of uh of fortune 500 companies and uh and many many other smaller companies on on helping people develop these uh these skills wow that's awesome so uh it's uh you know you decided to name it guru maker and uh, definitely it kind of took off well so obviously yeah. it's the name i would say yeah so, tell um, me what the, tell me yeah. what what does guru then mean um because i said spiritual leader that was my understanding what do you how do, how do you would you translate yeah, it or interpret so, it? So in indian context i would say a guru is a person who is like a command on a certain uh, so expertise and command on a certain subject so very similar to what the americans would say so oh, okay. uh, however the connotation uh, you know or the word comes from uh, the indian uh, language is what i presume so that's the reason i was curious uh, to know mm. uh, that mm -hmm. you know, why choice of this word so it's interesting gotcha. yeah yeah so, so uh, harrison apart from that i also understand that you are a pcc right are you also into uh, coaching as in uh, International Coach Federation? Are you part of that? I'm not part of the International Coach Federation, but I am an executive coach, yeah. I, uh, yeah, so I started coaching really like in the, in the mid 90s. Uh, and then, so the firm has been around now for 21 years. So yeah. Wow. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm certified in, uh, in various methods 
and uh, but never really thought to you know assemble it all to then get the IFC. I mean, I don't think it's necessary. It's I think it can help people. I can it can help people with um, you know as a credential that are just getting into coaching. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're an established coach and you have an yeah. established clientele, you've proven yourself. Right. I mean, it's I don't think it's necessary, but. Yeah. So most of the, you know, like great coaches and uh, trainers, like if you look at uh, Marshall Goldsmith or if you look at uh, Tony Robbins or Brian Tracy, some of these people, they don't have any uh, background in ICF uh, for that matter. So yeah. it's, it's not mandatory at all. Uh, it's it, it just so happened that, you know, like I thought of asking because mostly executive coaching you know, in corporates, uh, ICF has been given a lot of weightage. And I did my ICF uh, certification, uh, you know, six years back. Um, mm -hmm. But I've been in training and development all through in my life. So again, mm -hmm. you know, when you are in the field, you are kind of gaining, um, what should I say, experience and expertise, uh, which is more important than just having the credential itself. Yeah. Of course, yeah, exactly. True. So yeah. in, in this, in this, uh, you know, like journey of, um, you know, getting so many accolades, writing a book, getting published and, uh, you know, like getting corporate clients at a very early age of, you know, you being in your twenties, uh, how did it all feel? And, you know, how did you manage so much, uh, so much of success at that point in time? Um, well, it's a, uh, it's a small, I mean, it's a step-by-step -step process. You know, you have to get your first clients. So you have to develop credibility in order to get them. And uh, branding is a big part of it. And that's why Guru Maker as well, because it sort of stood out to people. And, but yeah, I think it's a combination of building relationships, letting people know what you do, mm -hmm. and then proving it. Proving it. I mean, your your client's success is your success. So if your clients improve, and if their leadership says yes, this person has improved drastically, True. then True. that reflects positively on the coach. And then, of course, you can use that to again, you know, communicate that to other clients. I mean, in the form of testimonials or word of mouth. A lot of our clients come to us word of mouth, the referrals, or they discover the books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. or uh, mm -hmm. the CR website. So it, uh, you hardly do any marketing at all. So it's, it's, you know, it's posts, it's writing articles, certainly, but not any traditional marketing uh, or advertising at all. So, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's building your credibility. Sure. Little so by little, stone by stone. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so when you say that branding, you know, like, and you say that, you know, you have not gone the digital marketing way um, or uh, the social media way in a big uh, kind of investment, et cetera, it's been more organic, right? So it's been, uh, yeah. Yeah. Internally, you know, brick by brick, you have built the business, right? Right, exactly. But of course, mm -hmm. you have to be. So we have a website. In fact, we're uh, about to launch our new website here in a, two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. I would say social media, whether it is Instagram, mm -hmm. certainly LinkedIn. Sure. I think uh, putting your putting your ideas out on LinkedIn is important, so that people can find you. They can see what absolutely. What are your? How do you think about things? What's your view? Right. What's your method? What's your philosophy? You know, so and uh, if people like that, they see something they like, then they go, you know what? I maybe I'll uh, give them a shot. You know, give them a call. Yeah. So, but I think it's got to be a combination of organic and then some sure targeted. Brilliant. Uh, so you know, like, uh, has there been any special formula uh, in context to branding? So when you went about popularizing, whether it's your work that you do, apart from LinkedIn, apart from social media, um, mm -hmm. and the credibility that you built over a period of time, what was your kind of mantra in terms of uh, building your brand? And are you happy with it? Or do you feel that you could have done more? I feel like I certainly could have done more in terms of broadcasting it. 
Right. You know, when our first book came out, 2006, 2007, actually. Yeah. I mean, this is this was what 13, 13 years ago. Right. You know, in that time, you could have built a pretty big list. You know, in terms of steadily. Never really focused on that. Right. And right. Uh, so that's something that where I could have done more. But overall, I think my philosophy or my approach was to to develop or to build social proof, mm -hmm. build social proof. Because if you work with big brands, you know, yeah. whether it's Deloitte yeah. or MetLife or yeah. PepsiCo or these companies, mm -hmm. that to me was important to do good work for them, right. to do excellent work for them. And then again, another company sees that and says, okay, well, they trust him, yeah. right? So yeah. I think we can take a shot because people don't want to make the wrong decision. So if you build credibility with other big brands and, and respected companies mm -hmm. and you keep working for them, mm -hmm. then that's a great sign, better than any advertising you could possibly yeah. have of credibility and of a, a, a sense of safety for these uh, new clients. Excellent. Yeah, the reason why I asked is because your book came out quite some time back and around the same time or maybe a little earlier than that, um, this book, Seven Habits and uh, Stephen Covey and all these were happening as well, right? So the kind of marketing, structuring and uh, the popularity it has gained uh, across the globe has to do in terms of a lot of marketing gimmick, uh, you know, etc. that went around the place. So that's the reason I asked whether you're happy in terms of uh, the way things have gone or could it, could it have been better than where it is today? Yeah, we could have always put in more effort, but yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty happy the way things uh, have gone. Awesome. awesome. Okay, so, you know, like uh, one thing that uh, we always uh, feel uh, about success is that, you know, it's, a, uh, it's, it's very difficult in life. It's, uh, it's hard to get, et cetera. So what's your perspective about success? Because you have gained so much in your professional life. Uh, what in your mind is true success? Yeah, so I think it is very personal, right? What success is. So for some people, it's material gains, uh, making a ton of money. Others, it's being able to have the freedom to do, design your own work day, Right. not having to report to anyone per se. So, and I would say for me, it's a combination of certainly there has to be a good, it has to be profitable. There has to be a good income attached to it. Right. And right. because you do work that is of value to lots of people and companies. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, success is being able to do what I do or what I love to do, I should say. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so I, I was able to follow my passion right. and being able to do this and every day be able to say, today I'm helping people. Today I'm making a difference in someone's life. Sure. And then building on that. And again, being the sort of the, the, the captain of your own ship and, and, and designing your yep. own, how you do the work, right? No one, no one is telling me, hey, here's how we'd want this done please do it like that. Yeah, right. So that's, it was never, that was never something I was uh, interested in. So I created my own methodology and I, I, you know, picked and chose whatever I felt was the most beneficial and powerful. And uh, that worked for me, you know? So, yeah. So that to me is, is success and, uh, and having the freedom to do those things. So I would say, yeah, that would be it. Right, right. Uh, so, you know, you mentioned uh, you are doing this executive coaching and executive presence rather and communication. So do you feel that, you know, in context to success uh, in leadership roles in corporates, as well as if you are playing them in public sector or even in government, um, it could play a role or it has its own benefits in terms of uh, not only reading the book, but also getting into a workshop like that. Um, 
Run that by me again. You're saying does success play a role? Uh, is success different in public life than in a corporation? Or what do, you, what, do you, what do you mean? Yeah, so what I mean is that is executive presence important yeah. in creating success, whether you are in public sector, government, yeah. or in corporates? Yes, absolutely. I believe so. I believe so. Based on my research and based on global surveys that have been done, you know, one survey... Uh, showed that uh, I think 268 executives were uh, uh, asked and and basically they found that it, executive presence contributes is it's it's 26 percent of a promotion decision mm -hmm. is based mm -hmm. on one's executive presence. You know, another survey had had I think 89 percent of a sample of 400 chief executives or corporate executives and chief executives saying that mm -hmm. executive presence can help people get ahead. And 78% and said that limited presence can actually hold someone back. So I think it's incredibly important, you know. And again, it just depends on how do you define executive presence? Like, what is that? Yeah. It is not, yeah. it's not the same as charisma. It is not the same as personal magnetism. Those are certainly, sure. you know, sure. good aspects of it. It's also not just speaking well and, and, and again, having confidence. There's so much more to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think... You know, even emotional intelligence, dem demonstrating emotional intelligence are part of executive presence. So, yeah, I think it's absolutely a, a big part of success, especially as you take on more and more leadership uh, responsibilities. So if you had to define it in a few words that this is what is executive presence, what would it mm -hmm. be? I would say executive presence is... Um, it, it's sort of a combination of certain traits, skills, behaviors, judgment, temperament, that all add up to a positive influence mm -hmm. uh, and, and a positive impact on the people around us. Now, you can have a dark executive presence, certainly, uh, mm -hmm. where you have executive presence, but you're intimidating, you're dark, right? Right. you are right. manipulative, you're a demagogue, right? You, you um, appeal to the most base emotions in people and get them fired up. But that's not the kind of executive presence I teach or I coach, you know? So I, I would say I would teach a, an ethical executive presence, so. So if you had to name a few popular, uh, maybe figures uh, who we can relate to in terms of um, such a presence, uh, you know, can you cite some examples which would help us relate to? Yeah, and I think, you know, sometimes I ask, I ask my uh, uh, people in my workshops, what does executive presence mean to you? Think yeah. of someone that you think has it and yeah. right, what are those qualities? So it's very easy for people to, 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 to pick someone and to say, you know, this person has executive presence and here's why. So they pick one or two qualities, you know. But mm -hmm. you know, a couple of people, uh, Indra Nui uh, from PepsiCo had to me <laughs> tremendous executive presence, a quiet power, the ability to communicate, courage, incredible courage, you know, speaking truth to power. Uh, Sajan Nadella has incredible uh, executive presence to me. Uh, and so there are so many people that, you know, and the thing to remember is that executive presence is not, it's not fixed. Mm -hmm. We all have an executive presence profile, right? We're, we're stronger in some areas and perhaps not so strong in others. So it's, the key is to find out where you're not very strong. Sure. And uh, then shore up those areas or, or uncover blind spots mm -hmm. and mitigate maybe any weaknesses. And then also seeing how can you leverage your strengths, perhaps build on those. Right? Sure. Uh, but yeah, so it's, uh, you know, again, we, some, it's not a hundred percent thing, right? You might, uh, no. right? it's always it work might, in progress. It's true too. Work in progress and it's contextual too. You might have executive presence in one situation, but then lose it in another when maybe right, there's a higher status uh, individual or somebody in a higher level leadership position, you, all of a sudden you might get intimidated and so your executive presence is out the window. So, right, so it's, yeah. these are things yeah. important to remember, yeah. That was really helpful. Uh, so as we move on, uh, you know, Harrison, what are the behaviors and traits in your life which has really helped you carve out this niche for yourself and, you know, create success for yourself in the chosen profession that you have taken up? 
the behaviors. I would say the ability to communicate, mm -hmm. to communicate clearly, mm -hmm. make complex issues seem or articulate them in an easy to understand way. Mm -hmm. Political savvy. Sure. Understanding relationships and dynamics within organizations. Right. And, uh, and un being a good observer is very important. And being a good observer, having emotional intelligence, having social intelligence. Right. In, uh, mm -hmm. For instance, in my work, mm -hmm. I deal with leaders from so many different companies and so many different, of so many you know, different personalities. Right and right. temperaments and so i have as an executive coach of course i have to adapt my style no. and different mm -hmm. cultures you know i've worked with many leaders from india many yeah. from yeah. from other asian countries mm -hmm. latin america mm -hmm. europe the united states you know, north america and so you have to also be able to adapt and to understand what success means for that person yeah. or in that particular yeah. organization mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. success in one organization isn't necessarily the same as success in another, so you have to understand how does the system operate and what makes someone successful in this system versus another. So those are some of the things that I think helped me develop my message as well as be successful with, with these different stakeholders. Wow, excellent. And what's been the most, uh, you know, like uh, important achievement uh, that you look back and feel great about? I feel great about. Well, I feel great about having uh, written five books. Wow! Uh, because that's something. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's a uh, it's an arduous process. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's it requires a lot of you know focus and dedication, and uh, so being able to do that and and uh, and affect people that I'll never meet mm -hmm. in different uh, areas right. of the world, and I get emails from. Mm -hmm. Algier, I get emails from Europe, I get emails from, from Asia saying that, hey, your book has changed my life or I've learned so many things from your book. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that's probably one of my, yeah, the things that I'm Very most beautiful. content about, yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. Uh, so, uh, you know, Harrison, uh, you've navigated your life so well, things have been working great. Uh, uh, God's uh, blessings and stuff. Uh, who has been able to really inspire you to come into this profession or maybe take a different kind of path in life that you have taken rather than going for a conventional job, working there? Like you said, that you know nobody's telling you to do things. You're doing it on your own, designing your life every single day. So who inspired you the most? Who's your role model in life? There isn't one person. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I get inspired by, by different people. I mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't say I have a particular role model, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm inspired by different things in people. Uh, uh, whether it's writers mm -hmm. that write a certain way, right. that inspires me to write better, to learn to write better, uh, whether it is speakers or people that communicate, whether it's business leaders that have a certain philosophy uh, but, uh, yeah, so it's really, I, I guess like an artist, I take inspiration from so many different things wow. and, wow. uh, which is to me, it, it's, it, it helps me in my workshops. It helps me in my talks that I give, it helps me in my writing because, you know, sort of, it's an eclectic, uh, philosophy of combining many different things in order to create something bigger and better even. And so, yeah, I'm inspired by lots of different things. You know, I can, I could hear a song and I could go up and I could connect it, you know, in three steps to something else that then I will use in my, in my workshop in order to get a point across a certain way. I might see a picture in a magazine or a headline that inspires me, uh, or again, a certain style of writing that makes me then gives me ideas and write about something else. So it, yeah, so I think you have to have an open mind. You have to be creative. Mm -hmm. and use all that to fuel whatever happens, whatever comes to you, you know? Right. Wow. That's like really a big revelation in terms of being an artist, right? I, yeah. I guess, you know, like as a speaker, as a writer, you need to evolve uh, constantly to uh, stay relevant uh, at all times. 
And that's yeah. something that, you know, kind of continuously happens, right? Right. I mean, I've said to people, I've, I've, I see myself, I'm as much of an artist as I'm an educator. So, and uh, yeah. I think the two are, are helping me bring the best to people. Yes. So you're a great right brain person or uh, do you have the left one participating equally? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm an all brain person. <laughs> That's a good one. All brain. <laughs> as okay. much as I can, as much as I can get to work, you know, I'm using it all. Awesome. So, uh, you know, like, uh, it's great, you know, like you're into writing, speaking, coaching. Uh, what are the things that you do on a daily basis to create success for yourself? Well, what's, what are your, some of the daily rituals which help you kind of uh, really carve out and uh, hone your craft? Um, I would say um, a habit that I've developed is to get up very early in the morning. So I get up at 4.30 in the morning. Awesome. And awesome. Uh, when it's still dark outside and I have a couple of hours of darkness before the sun comes up, and uh, where I can just have completely, complete silence and just maybe a small light on, and then I read. So I've made that time, and I've developed that ritual, I would say, just right after the pandemic started, uh, because I would say before, I always felt I was too busy. So, you know, I would get up at a more reasonable time, maybe six, and, uh, and then pretty much get to work right away. Oh. But it, it sort of, yeah, it wasn't, something was missing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I started getting up earlier and I spent a couple of hours reading and having my coffee and, and taking care of our dog, yeah. I, yeah. It, that calm and then learning. So when I start my day with learning and I enjoy learning, I start my day having just learned something and having been inspired by something. So when you start your day having learned something and being inspired already, well, think about how that colors and affects the rest of your day. Right? So you're really starting off on a good foot. So I would say that is something that uh, I will, yeah, and it's, I, I've been doing it for several months now and it works for me. And I noticed a difference when I don't do it, I feel I'm behind or something's missing. So this is something I'm doing for myself and it absolutely has an impact on my professional uh, um, impact that I have. Wow, it's such a coincidence uh, because, uh, you know, like it's been about, yeah, about six, eight months that I've been getting up at four as well. And my entire family, including my husband, uh, everyone's like, why do you need to get up that early? Because, you know, there's, uh, there's a lockdown nobody's going outside. And I say that, you know what, uh, the kind of me time that I get at that point in time, doing my mm -hmm. prayers, doing my yoga, and uh, getting ready for the day, you know, the spirit mm -hmm. that you build at that time stays with you till the time you go to sleep. So mm -hmm. very well yeah. said. That's a ritual which I, I wish I had started practicing when I was a kid. Uh, you know, it yeah. really helps. And I read somewhere, so it's called uh, uh, Robin Sharma, in fact, says five o'clock. Uh, but what they say in the Vedas is that if you get up between the timing of 3.30 and 4.30, uh, there's no traffic in the universe, right? So mm -hmm. whatever you want to achieve in life and whatever you're mm -hmm. praying for, uh, comes your way very well. So <laughs> I guess yeah. it really works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a big, made a big difference for me, uh, which is why I kept doing it. Sure, sure. Awesome. Uh, so, you know, everything's looking so rosy, everything's so great. One of the things that I want to ask you is, have you ever uh, faced failure in your life? And if yes, then how have you dealt with it? Faced failure? Um, yes, of course. Um, well, you know, I think, first of all, when you learn something, a mm -hmm. uh, new profession, uh, uh, whether it's you're passionate about it or not, you're not going to do it perfectly, or you're not going to do it in a way that maybe is the ideal way. So, you know, over, over the years, and whether it was working with people and, 
you know, not recognizing certain signs, you know, that someone is not ready, let's say. And let's use coaching, right? The, yeah. you know, years ago, I might have a couple of clients that I didn't recognize that they really weren't all that motivated or ready because they went into, they sought out coaching because they were sort of pressured, right, by maybe their superiors. Um, and rather than saying, yeah, it, that I don't think you're ready or, you know, or, or giving them the choice, mm -hmm. I would take the assignment and say, okay, well, let's, you know, we're going to do this. And then I took it upon myself mm -hmm. and in a way it became almost more important to me that it became to the person being coached sure. and that shouldn't be the case, right? This can't be more important to me than it is to the client, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and then when you work with someone like that, it, uh, A, you're not going to get any enjoyment out of it because they're not improving because they're not putting any effort behind it, you know, for whatever reason, but legitimate reasons. Um, but yeah, so then you try to push through and it just doesn't feel very good. You're not successful because the person is not, you know, really engaged in the process right. and uh so now if i if i have a sense of that you know i do extensive interviews with people mm -hmm. before i take them on as clients and uh i need to know that the person's fully engaged so you know, there was there was that um and, and you know you, you get bumps and bruises along the way and you learn from them uh, that's the key right anytime you you make a mistake or something happens that's not ideal, hopefully you take a lesson from it and change the way you do things the next time. So I've tried to do that as much as I can. And uh, I'm in a, I'm, I'm a, I guess I would say I have learning agility. So I certainly, in resilience, I learn from these things and then try to make different choices, right? So. Wow, that's amazing because uh, yeah, coaching if somebody is not ready for, it, it can be a tough job handling that person. Uh, yeah. and, you know, sometimes it's an assignment given to you by HR or uh, yeah. by the company itself and you can't even decline it because it's a responsibility given to you and the person seems disengaged. Uh, so, yeah, so getting it uh, corrected and, you know, navigating it well is something which is, uh, wow, remarkable. In fact, the way you have handled it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, you know, like uh, we spoke about a lot of serious stuff and all that, uh, you know, great things that you're doing. Uh, on a lighter note, uh, Harrison, uh, what is it that you like to do beyond work and, of course, your practice in coaching and uh, speeches, etc.? You said you have a dog and uh, very curious to know what dog it is because I have two as well. And also, you know, what are your other hobbies or uh, engagements which, uh, you know, give you a lot of joy in life? Hmm. Let's see. So uh, the dog is a, an 18 and a half year old dachshund uh, by the name of... 18 and a half. You are yeah, so 18 and lucky. <laughs> I know. I know. Very lucky. Now she'll be 19 in February. So very lucky. Um, so she's very sweet. I love animals. So I'm a big animal lover. We have a 21 and a half year old cat. So an and ancient cat as well. And uh, you feed them. I'm, I, you know, like I'm now going to really get the recipe <laughs> and the diet out of you or them. Right, right. I think it's key. Yeah, exactly. Feeding them healthy food and okay. keeping, keeping the stress out of their lives. You know, just not, not, you know, making sure they live a fairly stress-free life, which they do a lot of napping. I think they are fairly unstressed. But um, yeah, so I, you know, love animals. Uh, other than that, you know, I, I mean, we live in New York City. We live in Manhattan. Okay. And uh, used to live in Colorado, so there was a lot of outdoor opportunities. And uh, but yeah, so here in the city, I, I would say the reading is something that I get just tremendous enjoyment out of. You know, and then uh, going for walks, you go out to dinner when you can. I mean, obviously now it's you're limited, but um, going to Central Park and trying to get out into nature as much as possible. So those are things that are relaxing me, that are just providing joy from the day-to-day -day, uh, day -day activities. But uh, yeah, it's important to do that. And again, my morning ritual is part of that. That's just time for me, right? 
uh, were not dedicated to clients, not dedicated to anyone else, but just carving out two hours for myself. And I think that's important because otherwise I think you can get burned out uh, over time. Yeah, because the pandemic has really taught us and, you know, like it was like a wake up call. We really don't know how much time we have on this planet, right? So to be able to engage in things that give us true joy, that's uh, mm. even it by itself. So, you know, like it says that uh, um, if you have a good immune system, it helps you in terms of, you know, staying away from um, Corona. Uh, but uh, yeah, building immunity system is all about doing certain things which give you a lot of joy. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Good one. Uh, so before we leave today, what is your mantra for our audience uh, that can help them in terms of achieving success, achieving their goals and uh, living a very fulfilling life? Well, I think one thing that might help people is to really think about where they, where they want to be, mm -hmm. whether it's thinking about your personal brand, mm -hmm. how you want to be seen by the world, sure. figuring out what are the qualities you need, mm -hmm. uh, what are the steps to get there, and then, and and you don't have to figure it out on your on your own. You can ask people, you know. I'd like to be seen as this, or I want my brand to be this. How do you think I can get there? What do I need to do? What do you need to see from me in order to see me like that, right? And then it becomes a process. It can take years, it can take months, it can take weeks. Right. Um, so I would think, uh, you know, have an ideal, have an image of yourself, sure. which is sort of your goal, and then put steps into place on how to get there as one. And then the other thing I would say is, you asked me earlier about, you know, what's my definition of success? And I think if you make sure that your, that your values match your commitments, sure. you know, that, that you're happy and that you're fulfilled. Sure. Because a lot of time we might be spending money and time on things, uh, investing in things that ultimately don't make us happy, right? Or we're working in a job that doesn't make us happy. You know? when, when you think about the things that you spend more, or you're in a relationship that doesn't make you happy, right? Maybe it'll, it'll give you a little bit, but the majority of it is not just fulfilling you. And I think sure. taking stock, analyzing your situation, looking at all of those things, right. and then figuring out a way to maybe, you know, close that gap a little bit so that you are closer to your values, what truly makes you happy, what's important to you. And I think then that's a fortunate person to be able to do that. Um, and, and because then that relatively short time that we have on earth, I think uh, will be much, will be much nicer. <laughs> Very well said that, you know, um, absolutely. Because, you know, many times we just do things which make us look X, Y, Z, but it's not actually making us happy. So it's really not worth doing it, right? So very yeah. well. I think that's something that uh, it's high time we start realizing um, mm -hmm. after this pandemic, it's like eye opener for us. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So thanks so much, uh, Harrison, for making time for this. And we wish My pleasure. you all the best for uh, the new edition of executive presence. And of course, uh, you know, this is going to help a lot of uh, leaders and uh, leaders to be in future. And of course, in various sectors and all the very best and uh, great having you on same the show. You. Uh, so Thank that you, I wish was, the same for you. Yeah, uh, that was Harrison, uh, dear friends. And he is a person who coaches people on executive presence and who makes their life uh, so much easier in terms of carving out their niche and their revenge in where they want to be. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samadhi. So